Billy Strayhorn was a musical genius. He created hundreds of compositions and arrangements for Duke Ellington's band, often anonymously, and hundreds more for others. He wrote hit songs, concert pieces, films, Broadway scores. He was a friend of Martin Luther King Jr. and was active in the civil rights movement. You might wonder how come he isn't better known? Well, the answer lies in part in his humble nature and in part in the intertwining of his talent with that of the ebullient Duke Ellington to the extent that Billy often was overlooked. But Billy Strayhorn's genius lives on and we are happy to celebrate it with you today on this 100th anniversary year of his birth. You'll be hearing two of his great tunes played under this narrative, Lotus Blossom near the end, and you're hearing A Flower is a Lonesome Thing right now. He was born without a name and spent his entire life quietly making one. When he came to life November 29, 1915 in Ohio, his parents, James and Lillian, already had lost two babies, and this new one was sickly and had rickets. They decided not to give him a name right away, referring to him on the birth certificate as Baby Boy Strayhorn. It wasn't until five years later that they formally named him William Thomas Strayhorn. In the interim, the family had embarked on a series of moves that would take them from Ohio to New Jersey and finally the Pittsburgh area. At age 11, Billy's family had their first long-term residence in the Homestead District of Pittsburgh, and it was there during his teenage years that he started writing poetry, songs, and lyrics that would later bring him unending praise but little immediate fame. The young Strayhorn was a hard worker, he starting as a grade schooler and for years thereafter he sold newspapers. He was a delivery boy for drugstores and he was a soda jerk. His goal was to get enough money to buy a piano, a goal that was actually formed in North Carolina. From age five onward, his mother had sent him there to spend weeks at a time with his grandmother in part to avoid the increasingly frequent mental abuse from his father. Grandma Strayhorn was the accompanist at her church and had a piano at home. And Billy would, as he put it, toddle over to the keyboard and pick out things he liked. Eventually, by scouring around Pittsburgh, he found a piano he could afford, an old upright with a broken roll mechanism. He spent out endless hours practicing and expanding his knowledge of music, and all the money he earned went to pay for lessons and to buy sheet music, which his sister recalled was piled up four feet high in the corner of one room at one time. And Billy's career essentially started at Westinghouse High School, where a young music teacher named Carl McVicker would instruct such eventual young stars as Ahmad Ahmad Jamal, Strayhorn, and Errol Garner. McVicker said Strayhorn worked so hard, he sounded like a professional among amateurs. He could play ballroom music, he could play Grieg sonatas, and in fact, he wanted to be a concert pianist. But at that time, a black concert pianist was unthinkable. Billy also started writing pieces to play for high school assemblies and graduations and put together a show called Fantastic Rhythm for the senior talent event called The Stunt Show in 1934. It was so highly praised that a couple of backers put up money to expand it and it eventually went on tour in high schools and black theaters around the area. Its popularity attracted better performers such as Billy Eckstein and Errol Garner himself took over the piano when Strayhorn left to focus again on his hopes for a classical piano career. Fantastic Rhythm showed off Strayhorn's exceptional skill and his advanced musical knowledge. Only one song, however, was published and later recorded entitled My Little Brown Book, which we'll get to a little later on. What we're going to get to now is a song Strayhorn started writing two years before Fantastic Rhythm, and he didn't complete it until two years after, in 1936. He was tinkering and tweaking until he felt it was right. The lyrics are derived from a poem the teenage Strayhorn had written originally called Life is Lonely. Now it's retitled Lush Life. Strayhorn said he never intended for it to be published and he only played it at parties. But he yielded to pressure and recorded it in 1949 for an album from which it was dropped. But word on the brilliance of the piece was out. 
and Nat King Cole and others soon followed with recordings of it. Now here's our band and vocalist Kevin Whalem with one of Strayhorn's best known and most praised works, Lush Life. Those come what may places Where one relaxes on the axis of the wheel of life To get the feel of life From jazz and cocktails The girls I knew had sad and sullen gray faces With distant gay traces that used to be there, you could see where they'd been washed away by too many through the day. Twelve o'clock tales. Then you came along with your siren song to tempt me to madness. For a while, with your poignant smile was tinged with the sadness of a great love for me. Ah, yes, I was wrong. Again, I wrong life is lonely again and only last year everything seemed so sure now life is awful again a trough full of hearts could only be a poor. A week in Paris would ease the bite of it. All I care is to smile in spite of it. I'll forget you, I will, while yet you are still burning inside my brain. Romance is mush, stifling those who strive. I'll live a lush life in some small dive And there I'll be while I rot with the rest Of those whose lives are I just learned backstage, by the way, that Kevin has an album for sale in the lobby after the show, and he'll be glad to autograph it. All right. Lush Life is also the title of the definitive biography on Strayhorn, written by David Haydu. Haydu says he spent 3,000 hours interviewing a couple of hundred of musicians, relatives, and associates of Strayhorn. The writer pored over Strayhorn's personal papers and music, and he did numerous other research to try to determine whether Billy Strayhorn was unique and a genius 
or merely an extension of Duke Ellington's musical persona, as some jazz scholars have claimed. Haydu's book and a more technical book called Something to Live For by Dutch musicologist and jazz man Martin van der Lohr are the source of much of the information you're hearing. Haydu says one thing about the Ellington Strayhorn team is indisputable, namely, Strayhorn served as Duke's arranger for most of almost 30 years. He composed the Ellington Orchestra's theme, Take the A Train. He composed, co-composed rather, with Duke such classics as Satin Doll. Ellington says he and Billy were so alike that Strayhorn, quote, was my right arm, my left arm, all the eyes in the back of my head, my brain waves in his head, and his in mine. Duke acknowledged Strayhorn's input when joking on stage that shows that Strayhorn does a lot of the work, but I get to take the bows. <laughs> in addition to his musical brilliance, Billy Strayhorn had a wide array of cultural interests. He was widely read. He would spend hours in libraries and museums. He studied nonfiction books, and he took long walks in nature, all of which inspired his musical thoughts. A painting by James McNeil Whistler of a bridge scene is said to have been in his mind as he wrote a piece called Chelsea Bridge that was recorded in 1941. Like many of his songs, Chelsea Bridge captivated his peers. Jerry Mulligan said, he just blew us away because he was doing very complicated, sophisticated things and they didn't sound complicated to the ear at all. The greatly admired composer Gil Evans said, from the first time I heard Chelsea Bridge, I set out to try to do that. That's all I ever did, try to do what Billy Strayhorn did. Here's Chelsea Bridge now, featuring trombonist Roland Barber.
Though Strayhorn composed and arranged mostly for the full orchestra, plus some small group offshoots of the Ellington Band, he occasionally experimented with smaller combos, including his own Mad Hatters trio back in Pittsburgh. Just before joining Duke in 1939, Strayhorn had put together a piece for the Mad Hatters that Ellington's saxophonist Johnny Hodges later came upon. It's called Your Love Has Faded, and it became the first Strayhorn song to be recorded by Johnny Hodges and a small group. Strayhorn wrote the lyrics as well, and here's Kevin again in the band, Kevin again with Your Love Has Faded. Your love has faded, it's not what it used to be. You don't belong to me completely. Your kiss is colder, there's none of that old desire, none of that burning fire that thrilled me. I don't know what has changed you. I've never been untrue someone has rearranged you and all i get for being true is just a frozen kiss or two your love has faded it's not what it used to be i burn it all in for free and it has faded into the night Lately I've begun to see That what was once your love for me 
me has turned into a knot to warm affection. Even your caress that used to have such fine fitness is but an empty gesture of what it used to be. The Ellington Strayhorn collaboration took on an unusual turn on New Year's Day of 1941. That's when radio stations around the country refused to play any music composed by members of the ASCAP union in a dispute over how much the stations had to pay in fees for the materials done by ASCAP members. Duke belonged to ASCAP. He also was strongly dependent on radio gigs for both immediate income and promotion of record sales and band bookings. And so he was about to open a two-month gig at a California night spot featuring radio broadcasts every night, and suddenly, zilch. However, Strayhorn was not an ASCAP, nor was Duke's son, Mercer, so Duke ordered them to write new arrangements so he could still go on the air. And said Mercer Ellington, all of a sudden there was this freak opportunity. Literally overnight, we got the chance to write a whole new book for the band. Well, Mercer and Billy had remained behind in Chicago while the band traveled west, and in the three days before the next train to California and while on it, they churned out new scores as fast as they could. Strayhorn's stack included Chelsea Bridge and A Flower is a Lovesome Thing. When they arrived in California, they continued writing pieces Ellington could play on the air. One of those was Strayhorn's Rain Check, which he says was the result of him spending three straight months in his room while it rained outside. Here's Rain Check.
Another of the new pieces was entitled Passion Flower, and like many of Billy Strayhorn's ballads, lyrics weren't really necessary to sense the emotional darkness in it. One of the teenage friends who spent lots of time with Strayhorn says Billy went through a lot of abuse in his life from his father on down through school where kids called him a sissy. He says Strayhorn kept it all in, maintaining a facade of gentil politeness, but his emotions came out in his music. And here's the band featuring Dennis Soley on saxophone with Passion Flower. Thank you. 
Dennis Soli. <laughs> Strayhorn's music often had a kind of second life. He would write it and perform it, and then it would sit for a while until being rediscovered. Such was the case with the aforementioned My Little Brown Book, the only one of his high school musical pieces to be subsequently recorded much later. Here's Kevin and the band to reveal what's in that little brown book. I used to have your picture, a ring that once was yours, and other little fixtures that every boy adores to have. To remind him of the girl he loves But since the day you went away And left me all alone The only thing that I can say You left to be my own Is just this little brown My little brown boo With a silver binding How it keeps reminding me Of a memory that's haunting me In some quiet nook I go through Of a love that failed to ever become true. On this page is the day of that fateful night at eight when I found we were no longer in love. After that, there's nothing more, just a dark and cruel door that shuts out the stars above in my little. And that last sweet kiss is all I've left of you. Is all I've left of you. out the stars above in my little book I inscribed your heart vows but since we're apart now this and that last sweet kiss is all I've left of you is all I've left of you A 
Long years after that high school burst of creativity, Strayhorn continued to display his rare ability to imagine how tunes and arrangements should sound and then sit down and write them. A prime example is Isfahan, probably the best number in Ellington's Far East Suite recording in 1964. It was based on impressions Duke and the band gathered from a swing through Japan and a bunch of Near and Middle East countries, including Iran. Duke was highly impressed with the old Persian capital of Isfahan, calling it a city of poetic beauty. Well, Strayhorn didn't see Isfahan, he didn't go on the tour. But he had written a soulful tune with poetic beauty a few months earlier that he thought might just fit the album. The tune was called Elf. Duke loved it and renamed it, and here's the band with Isfahan.
And let me introduce behind me on drums, Chester Thompson. Roger Spencer on bass. To my right, Dennis Soley, saxophone. George Tidwell, trumpet and flugel. <laughs> Roland Barber, trombone. <laughs> Kevin Whalem, vocals. And Lori Meacham, piano. <laughs> well, you know, the merger of the Strayhorn and Ellington talents was the result of a large dollop of gall on Strayhorn's part in 1939. And Billy was well known in Pittsburgh musical circles by then, and he and friends eventually prevailed upon a well-connected acquaintance of Ellington to introduce Billy to Duke when the Ellington Orchestra was booked for a two-week run in Pittsburgh. Strayhorn was ushered into Duke's huge dressing room after the first show, and according to Haydu's book, Duke lay on a reclining chair with eyes closed and said, let's hear what you can do. Strayhorn stunned him by first playing exactly what Ellington had just done with sophisticated lady on stage, and then saying, here's how I would do it and expanding the piece remarkably. Duke stood up, he asked for more, and Billy played and sang a tune called Something to Live For, which he had written at age 18 with lyrics based on one of his poems. Billy's dressing room bravura was enough to get him invited to visit Ellington in New York. Now here's Kevin with Something to Live For, the song that probably clinched the Strayhorn-Ellington partnership, and one that Ella Fitzgerald later said would call her favorite song, but before he sings it, Kevin has some words to say about Billy Strayhorn. Thank you, Don. Uh, I would, first of all, just a little, a little housekeeping. I would be remiss if I did not recognize my lovely wife <laughs> and twin girls. Please stand up and let the people see you. Those twin girls are the reason I'll be glad to meet you at the table and s sign your CDs and take pictures and whatever dancing I need to do to, to accomplish the task of educating these women. Uh, in all seriousness, I, Billy Strayhorn, in my eyes, of course, unmitigated genius. But imagine, I, a part of me believes that that genius had to be forced out of him. It was, of course, a God-given gift to migrate himself toward that piano. There was something calling him toward those ivory keys and, and whatnot. But imagine having a father who didn't quite give you the things that you needed, who, who was upset at the you-ness of you, who was upset at the fact that you were not what he carved out in his head for you to be. And that translated to him, and he felt that and internalized that. And imagine being in that era gay, openly so, African-American, proud of it, but unable to express either of those prides in public. Now you take a 16-year-old who's in his room, I assume, or near a piano, and he writes lush life? 16, the depth and the complexity of those chords and that melody and those lyrics far beyond my comprehension of what a 16-year-old should be capable of. That's why he's a genius. And so I just wanted to relay that to you and let you know that as I stand here as a happily married heterosexual black man in this day and age, the angst and the darkness of so many of Billy's songs and melodies are so appropriate because he had to have an outlet to live. I have almost everything a human could desire. Cars and houses, bearskin rugs to lie before my fire. But there's something missing Something isn't there, it seems 
I'm never kissing the one whom I could care for. I want something to live for. Someone who An adventurous dream Oh, what wouldn't I give for Someone who take my life And make it seem as they say it ought to be. Why can't I have a love like that brought to me? My eye is watching the noon crowd searching the promenade seeking a clue. Something to live for. Kevin Whalum. Yeah. In 1953, after 14 years of total commitment to Ellington, Billy Strayhorn took a few steps outside Duke's sphere of interest. He got involved playing summer stock, then writing for an off-Broadway musical. Uh, he also began to write a major musical called Rose-Colored Glasses with Juilliard-trained colleague Luther Henderson, and Billy churned out words and music for nine numbers, and one of them had his old friend Lena Horne in mind. It was called, Ooh, You Make Me Tingle. <laughs> <laughs> Although Henderson and Strayhorn later dropped the musical, Billy saw to it that Lena recorded the song when he joined her on the road in 1955 for several months. Here's Kevin with, Ooh, You Make Me Tingle. Make me tingle with delight Oh, on every single summer night I'm a wreck and I expect I need protection from your voltage Ooh, you make me tingle with suspense Though I know this thing will make no sense Don't relent, I'm heaven bent And so content just to live this love You're the girl that makes my brow on a wrinkle you're the girl that makes my footsteps tinkle You're the girl that sets my life a twinkle So stand real close Ooh, you make me tingle with your spell My, my heart just jingles like a bell I am a fool, so let me drool But please don't cool, oh baby, love, love you Oh, 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 oh,
Actually, old friend is not a sufficient description of Strayhorn's relationship with Lena Horn. And though they both were teenagers in Pittsburgh, they didn't get together until 1941 in Los Angeles, where Lena was trying to jumpstart her career, and Duke Ellington was trying to shield her from marauding Hollywood males. <laughs> he told Strayhorn, look after her, as Billy put it, and they hit it off immediately, going to shows and museums, talking for long hours, day after day, Lena said he was like a professor to her, a brilliant guru, gentle and loving. She fell in love with him and said she wanted to marry him. He was everything she wanted in a man except, of course, being gay. He was not interested, <laughs> not interested in her sexually. Lena said they were in love despite that, and he was the only man she ever really loved. They were together when news of Pearl Harbor came over the radio, and according to Lena, Billy said, it's all over and left at once for New York, where the draft board told him he was 4F because of severe myopia. After the war, Billy accompanied Lena Horne to Paris for her unpublicized wedding to longtime MGM conductor and arranger Lenny Hayton. She said since she couldn't have Billy, she allowed herself to fall for Hayton. Billy approved of Hayton, otherwise Lena said she would not have married him. Hayton and Billy became close friends, and it was Hayton who encouraged Strayhorn to look more closely into his arrangement with Ellington financially and artistically, and Mercer Ellington said that was the beginning of problems with Duke. Well, during the separation from Ellington, Strayhorn also wrote some lighthearted things for a song and dance group called the Copacetics. One of them later was recorded by Duke in 1956, when Strayhorn was back in the fold. It was named after the medical clinic where Billy's personal physician and friend, Dr. Arthur Logan, worked. And here's the band with Upper Manhattan Medical Group, known by its acronym UMMG. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> Thank you. 
Back with Ellington, Billy worked on new arrangements for the orchestra's Newport Jazz Festival debut, plus a major CBS special, and an original suite of pieces for the Shakespeare Festival at Avon in England. In addition, Billy was always conscious of racial discrimination issues, and he was a friend of Martin Luther King Jr. Billy took part in a number of civil rights events, and at one in Mississippi, he taught Lena Horne how to sing Amazing Grace. But early in 64, Billy showed up at Dr. Logan's house out of breath and ailing. Soon it was clear Billy Strayhorn had a very serious cancer of the esophagus. Nevertheless, he continued to compose and arrange, including a major concert featuring him at piano with a sextet playing Billy Strayhorn originals. He thought of taking it on the road because of its success, but his deteriorating health intervened. And Lena Horn and her husband took Billy to Palm Springs to rest in the western sun, but he knew the end was near. He flew back to Pittsburgh to say goodbye to his family, then to New York where he was hospitalized for his final days. Ellington called every day, as did Lena Horn, who was on tour in Europe. On May 31, 1967, Billy Strayhorn died at the age of 51. Ellington was playing in Reno at the time, where Arthur Logan phoned him with the news. Duke broke into tears and was asked, if he'd be all right. Hell no, he said. I'm not gonna be all right. Nothing's gonna be all right now. Well, Ellington took to playing Strayhorn's punk composition called Lotus Blossom to close many of his concerts thereafter. And it was added to his Strayborn, Strayhorn rather tribute album entitled And His Mother Called Him Bill. Duke did an emotional impromptu solo of Lotus Blossom after the recording session for the album was ended, but engineers discovered a tape was still running, and it was thus added to the album, and like much of Strayhorn's work, Lotus Blossom evoked a, a wistful mood. Billy Strayhorn, born without a name, was called a lot of nicknames over the years, among them Strays, Sweepy, Wheelie, Itty Bitty Buddy, Bill. He was also called Sensitive, thoughtful, brilliant, a genius. 
As for what Duke Ellington thought, he added this in the liner notes of his tribute album to Billy, quote, he was a beautiful human being, a man with the greatest courage. He lived in freedom from hate, freedom from all self-pity, freedom from fear of possibly doing something that might help another more than himself. The legacy he leaves, wrote Duke, will never be less than the ultimate on the highest plateau of culture. Well, however, history determines how much by Duke and how much by Strayhorn went into the Ellington Orchestra's fame. One thing is certain, it started in 39 in Pittsburgh when Ellington invited Strayhorn to visit him in New York and gave Billy instructions on how to locate him there. Strayhorn at once composed music and lyrics, including those instructions for what would become the Duke Ellington Orchestra signature song. And here's Kevin in the band to conclude our presentation with that number, Take the A-Train.
now it's coming I listen to those rails that thrumming All aboard Get on the air train Soon it will be your sugar hill and hollow Soon you will be your sugar hill and hollow Soon, you will be your sugar hill and Ladies and gentlemen, on drums, Chester Thompson, Roger Spencer on bass, Dennis Soli, saxophone, George Tidwell, trumpet and toast, Roland Barber on trombone, Kevin Willem on vocals, <laughs> and Lori Meacham on piano. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Oh yeah, I'm Don O'Henry. <laughs>